one thing uh, I forgot to put in the announcements for Tony to share with you is uh, we are uh, modern now, and oh, yeah. we actually have PayPal on our church website. Wow. And if for any reason uh, you know you're not able to you know, come to church, whatever you would still like to give for that week, uh, you can do so on our website. Just push PayPal and pay with whatever major credit cards you have. Uh, she, I mean, you can give as much as you want. I mean, you know, if you want to give a thousand dollars, well, it, it, it'll work. Ten thousand dollars, it'll work. And uh, we'll be able to give you the credit and everything that you need with that. So, anyway, just want to make you aware of that. And uh, it's, it is available. Uh, well, praise God. I'm excited for another Sunday. Amen. It's always good to get together. This morning, uh, we're going to continue our series. Uh, we're actually talking about the armor of God at this time. Last week, we talked about the belt of truth, and we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. I'm not going to review because there again, you can go back to EvansvilleCrosswalk.com and all the messages uh, this year and last year are, are on there. So if you can go and just click on past sermons and uh, pick that up and they're available for you. So we're going to pick up this morning talking about our shoes. And uh, I said I, I, I should have wore better shoes this morning because everybody's going to be looking at them because I'm talking about shoes. Um, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15, it reads there, And having shod your feet, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, if I had the money, I would have me a very nice collection of nice shoes. Right now, I have one pair of nice shoes. Dress shoes. These are not it. I have one pair of really nice dress shoes, but I have several pair of good shoes. But I have one pair of nice shoes. I remember when I was a young man, early 20s, uh, with a very young family. At that time, Charity was just born and Tony was about three years old. I was on staff at a church here in town. And I worked a full-time job as well. And the, the only suits I had to wear were used. Uh, they were given to me by uh, uh, my cousin's husband, Jerry, who has actually gone to be with the Lord, but he, had, he was a salesman. And he had like four or five suits that he was getting rid of, and he was about the same height and everything as I was. So they fit pretty well, and uh, he gave me those suits. And I wore those suits every Sunday. They weren't the most modern suits, but they weren't all that bad. But I tell you what was bad was the shoes that I wore with those suits. I wore suits a lot back in those days because in that particular denomination and so forth it was kind of expected of you. And you know, back you know, 30 years ago or so, uh, it was just more common to dress up to go to church. Now church is much more casual than what it used to be and, and I'm all for that. But, uh, uh, but at that time, all the other pastors had like really nice suits. And they had these fancy ties. I mean, that was the big thing. Oh, where'd you get that tie? That's a sharp tie. You know, we'd all talk about our ties. And and, uh, and they all had great shoes. I mean, they were shiny and they were slick and they were you know, just nice looking shoes that, that everybody wore. Well, one of the pastors noticed my shoes. And uh, he said, hey, I want to take you out and buy you some shoes. And so this pastor took me out and bought me two uh, brand new pair of nice shoes. And then the pastor uh, of the church that I was on staff at went out and bought me this really nice suit to wear. I guess they were thinking, I don't want any of my staff members looking this bad. So they, they, they set me up. And I was uncomfortable with them doing that, but at the same time, I was grateful. Uh, it was just always hard for me to 
to receive like that. You know, somebody give me something. But uh, but I was grateful. I mean, I felt GQ in my new suit and my uh, new fancy dress shoes. Well, a few years ago, I ran into the pastor that bought me the shoes. I could swear he was looking at my shoes to see what kind of shoes I was wearing. And I don't think they were all that fancy at the time. But as I said before, I have one pair of nice shoes and uh, several pair of good shoes. The dress shoes are, are, are nice to style in, you know, to, to be dressed up and looking sharp. But the other shoes that I have, they're good shoes and they serve their purpose. They protect my feet from the heat when the streets are hot. They protect my feet from the cold when there's snow on the ground. Uh, they protect from such things as rocks and glass and things of that nature. And I, and I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but a lot of times I'll be in the house and I'll be barefooted and I'll remember something out in the car that I need to go grab. So I, I just run out my bare feet and we have a gravel driveway. And I tough it out and I start walking on that, you know, on that gravel. And it's like my halfway to the car. I'm thinking, why in the world did I not take time to put some shoes on? This hurts. It hurts walking on that gravel. As far as I ever made it in Boy Scouts was tenderfoot. And I think that's kind of where I remained. And uh, I don't have tough feet. But at the same time, the shoes, they, they protect you. And I've also worked many jobs that had environments where you had to have protective shoes, like steel toed shoes, to protect your feet. Well, I said all that to say this. The Roman soldiers wore shoes for all those reasons. And it was important also that they had sure footing whenever they would go into battle. They didn't want to slip and fall down. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they were able to stand and stand strong when they were in battle. So what is exactly Paul talking about whenever he says here that we have you shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Basically, when we receive the gospel, which is wonderful news, amen, the gospel is good news, we can stand sure. We can stand protected, standing in the peace of God. Do you realize how important it is to have the peace of God in your life? It, it, without it, I don't know what we would do. But we have His peace available to us. We have peace in the middle of the battle, just as Cheryl was saying just a moment ago. God doesn't always just pull us out of the fire, but He will go through the fire with us and protect us while we're there. We can know that we'll come out on the other side because we know that Jesus wins the war. Amen? And we are victors and overcomers. And we can be thankful that sometimes... Uh, even though things do not seem to be going the way we think they, they ought to go, we can know that because we love Him, that somehow He will work all those things out for good. And I know sometimes it's hard to see that when you're in the middle of a battle. But if you'll keep your eyes on Him and stay focused on Him and, 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 and put the gospel of peace on your feet, amen, and just rest in Him, that in, at the end of the day, well, it may not be the day, but at the end of that situation, that you will come out and God can take that and use it if we'll allow Him to, to bring something good out of it. Amen? So, if nothing else, if you cannot see anything good going on in your life right now, how do you know we all have those seasons? But I want you to know it's a season. It does not mean, you know, sometimes I, I, I lived in Florida for a couple of years. And I tell you, I got tired of the sunshine. You know, I mean, just every day, more sun, more sun. I started missing the seasons. So now that I'm back in, in Evansville, we have basically four seasons. And, and I said, I don't mind the seasons. I just don't want them overstaying their welcome. Amen. I don't want it to stay cold too long. I don't want it to stay hot too long. Now, fall and spring, I, I don't mind so bad. But I don't mind a little winter. I don't mind a little bit of cold. I don't mind some heat. But I just don't want it to go on forever. I want it to stay at proper time and leave. So sometimes we get in these seasons that are not so good, but seasons change. So we just need to, 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 to put on the gospel of peace, amen? Put on the gospel shoes of peace 
and, and walk in peace and rest in the Lord. Know that, that although these things are not good, know this is not a good season, we'll be thankful in all things. Amen. Not for all things, but in all things. We can find things to thank God for, even in the storm, even in those bad situations. If we just get our eyes on the negative part of it and the, and the situation itself, it'll consume us. But if we'll look up above and over the situation and keep our eyes fixed on Him and His goodness and know that, that He's not causing these things to happen, but He has the ability to make something good out of these things that are happening. Amen? Hallelujah. So as we look at this, we're reminded of the promise in God's Word. That, uh, well, before I read this verse to you, let me just say this. If you do not have anything else to be thankful for, Again, you can always be thankful that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can be thankful that you know that whenever you do pass on, as our brother Lloyd just passed on, you can know that you have an eternity waiting for you in heaven. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking about heaven. I, I say I always think about heaven. I always think about eternity when somebody's facing death. Because I look at that person and go, you are almost there. Now, we don't want anybody to die premature. That's one thing about Lloyd. I don't feel like Lloyd died premature. He, he was 95 years old. We had talked just a couple weeks ago, and he said he was ready to go, and he was not afraid. Now, I tell you, church, you can't really go out any better than that. 95 years old, ready to go, and know where you're going, not afraid of it. I mean, that's the way to go out. Amen? So we know that whenever we do go, whenever we pass through this line, we know that we have all of eternity waiting for us, and it's going to be glorious. So even though if we can't find anything to be thankful for here on this earth, start thinking about your name being written. Start thinking about when you stand before God. He opens up the book. You're standing there going, my name is in there. And you can stand in confidence because you know you made a decision to receive His Son as your Savior. And because of that, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And He's going to look there and He's going to go, there it is. Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. We're going to go, woo! <laughs> I'm ready, you see. So we can always find something to be thankful for, even if there's nothing on this earth that we can be thankful for. Sometimes we go through those times. Sometimes we go through those situations and it just nothing seems right. Nothing's going the way we want it to go. But yet we can still look up and be thankful that our names are written in His book. Amen? Hallelujah. And it goes on to say in Philippians 4, 7, Philippians 4, 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, listen, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We need His peace to guard our heart. You see, without His peace, your heart can be injured. Without His peace, your mind can be injured. That's why we need to put on the gospel of peace. Amen? And, and here in the armor, it talks about being the shoes. The next, we have the shield of faith. That's also a defensive weapon. In Ephesians 6.16, it reads there, Above all, now that tells me right there, this is very important, amen? Because he's talking about all these things. Then he says, above all. Above everything else, that's when my ears want to perk up and say, hey, I'm going to listen to what you got to say here. It's kind of like when Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you. I mean, verily, verily, I say unto you. That means, hey, listen, this is really important. Okay? Above all, he says, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, the Romans actually used more than one kind of shield during battle. One of the shields they used was called the Aspis. A-S-P-I-S. And it's a small round shield that had a leather strap that they were strapped to the wrist. And they would use it during combat. It was about this big. And, and they would hold it and they'd take their swords in one hand and they'd take that shield and they would fight and they would protect themselves with the shield as they would fight. The other type of shield is called the thurion. T-H-U-R-E-O-N. Now this shield measured about four and a half feet tall 
and about two and a half feet wide. Now what they would do with this shield, uh, well first of all, it was made of a thick uh, and, and, and a hard wooden plank. And it was covered with metal or leather, real thick leather. And the metal would deflect the enemy's arrows as they would shoot these arrows at them. Uh, the enemy, uh, or they would they would deflect, and sometimes when they would shoot these aerial arrows, they would have like a fiery pitch on them that would would shoot flames and try to catch them on fire. Well, these shields were made in such a way they wouldn't catch on fire, but they would uh, put them out, or they would knock them away where it would not penetrate them. Now, the soldiers many times would join together, and they would make a wall. A protection while they would advance the enemy. I was hoping to get a picture of this, but I didn't get to it. But you can imagine this: these Roman soldiers, all of them having these shields that are like four and a half foot tall, two and a half feet wide. They would join them together, a straight across, which would make just a huge wall. And they would advance toward the enemy while they had this shield of protection. And if the arrows would come this way, they would all just lift up their shields and would keep the fiery arrows from landing on them. So they were pretty sharp, weren't they? And so that's what it talks about taking the shield of faith. When we have this shield of faith, we're able to quench all the attacks of the enemy through our faith. Amen? Now, faith is more than a set of beliefs. You know, somebody say, well, what faith are you? You ever heard, heard that? What they're saying is, what, what is it you believe? What religion are you? Or something of that nature. Well, faith is more than a set of beliefs. It means to put your, put your weight on the foundation of what you believe. That's your faith. You're putting the, you're putting the weight of what you, uh, uh, the weight of the foundation of what you believe. Because of my faith, church, I am completely resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what my faith is. My faith is not in what I do or don't do. My faith is on what Jesus did for me. Amen. And I am resting in that finished work that He completed on the cross because my Lord Himself said, It is finished. That means He's completed the work and now I put my trust in Him and the sacrifice He provided for me I received that gift of salvation when I received Jesus Christ into my life. Amen? And that is talking what we're talking about when we talk about faith and resting on Him. Hallelujah. So get out. Put your shoes on. Amen? First, you know, put your belt on. We talked about last week, the belt of truth. And then put on the breastplate. You know, it, it covers like from the thigh up to the neck area. Protects all your vital organs. Then we, we put on our shoes, the, the, the gospel of peace, amen. And we rest in peace and put our, uh, allow his peace to uh, cover us. Then we, we, we get out our shield of faith. Sometimes we join together in that faith, amen, as we advance toward the gates of hell. The Bible says they will not prevail against us. Next, we put on the helmet. Of salvation. It reads in Ephesians 6 17, and take the helmet of salvation. And as I just mentioned, the, what we talked about last week, the breastplate of righteousness, that protects the vital organs from the neck down to the thigh. And in like manner, the helmet of salvation protects the vital organs of the head, it protects the brain. It protects the eyes. It protects the ears, the senses that are formed in the brain. The helmet of salvation protected the soldiers from the arrow and the swords that were swung by the enemy. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, our spiritual senses are protected by the helmet of salvation. Because of the helmet of salvation, we are able to be sensitive to to the voice of God. Amen? We see the enemy for who he is. He cannot deceive us as easily as those not wearing the helmet of salvation. See, we can make a choice, church, to put on the mind of Christ. But you have to do it. 
The scripture says, put on the mind of Christ. We can speak forth the word of God. We can destroy the works of the enemy. The word of God is powerful. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's talk about it now. Amen. That's the next weapon. It goes on to say, and finally, we have the sword of the Spirit. In Ephesians 6, 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. Now this is the one weapon wherewith we can attack the enemy. The Word of God. There's no doubt as to what the sword is. It, it tells us right there plainly. It is the Word of God. It is, it is our sword against the enemy. Jesus used it against him in the wilderness. You remember that over in Luke 4? The enemy would come and attack Jesus and Jesus would say, It is written. It is written. You know, we... We all must use it against him in our wilderness. And again, how many have been through or going through a wilderness? We all have, amen? It, it, it's common to man. Jesus said it was. But in those wilderness experiences, we must get a handle on the Word of God and take it to battle with us. We must practice sword fighting. How do you do that? You do it through reading the Word. You do it through listening to the Word. You do it through memorizing the Word. And most of all, most importantly, getting the Word of God down into your spirit. So important. You can't bring it to your remembrance if you haven't remembered it. Amen? Or haven't read it. But my memory is so bad. Well, just do your best. Amen? You'll be surprised at what God can do with that. In Luke, I said it's important to get it down to your spirit because Luke uh, 6.45, it says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is in your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. You know, it doesn't take me long to figure out where a person is spiritually. I mean, I'm not judging. I'm just recognizing. Okay? You can tell by the way they talk what's coming out of their mouth. You, you can see where a person is spiritually by what's coming out of their mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, what does the Bible say? The mouth speaks. So whatever is in there is going to come out. You know, some people can put on a good act for a little while, but eventually, what's in their heart is, is, is going to come out of their mouth. So, naturally, if you fill your heart with the Word of God, when the enemy comes to attack, what's going to come out? You know, I heard one person say, I'm not sure if I got this right or not, but he said, if you want to find out what's in a person, squeeze them. And the pressures of life sometimes will squeeze us. You know, we can talk a good talk until we're squeezed. You know, it's easy for me to stand up here and tell you all this, but you know, I gotta get down from the other side of this pulpit, and I gotta live it just like you do, and I'm gonna get squeezed just like you do, and if I don't have the word of God down in my spirit, whatever's in there is gonna come out. We all face situations. Life sometimes is a pressure cooker. Just don't let it blow your top. Amen? Anybody remember those pressure cookers? Maybe you still use them. My mom used to use them all the time. And they scared me. You know, it's like, Whoosh. I'm thinking, I think it's just going to explode and blow the kitchen up, you know? And I think I might even have one somewhere uh, around the house, but I don't think I'm going to use it. No, I don't cook anyway. And I don't think Cheryl's going to. Well, maybe we will, because I know that they're good. But you know, and sometimes pressure is good. It's nothing we like. There's nothing that God causes. I don't believe that at all. But life itself will bring pressure. And when that pressure comes, if we got the Word of God, it's just an opportunity to let the Word of God go to work. Amen. It's an opportunity to pull your sword out and start swinging, and just another victory against the enemy. Amen. And that's how we need to look at it many times. So as we get the Word of God down in our heart and then down into our spirit, it will come out with faith. It will come out and it will move the enemy out of your situation. It will move the enemy out of your circumstance. So we need to learn uh, uh, to declare God's Word. You know, I said there's a what's called a confession of faith. You know what that means? Just confessing the Word of God out of your mouth. 
you know, if the enemy comes up to you and says, you're going to have to file bankruptcy, you can take the word and say, but my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. You see, the enemy might come up and say, you're going to die. You say, by his stripes, I am healed. You see, take the word of God, the promises of God. We used to sing that back when I was in the Baptist church years ago growing up. Standing, standing on the promises of God. Anybody remember that song? That's all we're talking about. Just proclaiming, declaring God's promises. But you see, before you can make a confession of faith, sometimes we've got to make a confession unto faith. What does that mean? That just means getting God's Word down into your spirit, that it can come out of your spirit with force, with faith, because if you hear it, faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, you hear the Word, you get the Word down in your spirit, and it begins to come out of you, and it goes back into you. The next thing you know, man, you're walking in victory. Amen? But you got to start somewhere. We can't just sit around saying, I wish it were better. No, we begin to declare the Word of God and put the enemy to flight. Because the Word of God says this as well. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. The Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Do you know why we're more than conquerors? Because He's the conqueror, amen? He won the victory for us. That makes us more than a conqueror. I've shared this story several times, and I'll close with this. Uh, there was these two uh, two boxers in a ring, and uh, they were fighting for a million dollar bounty. And I mean, they're just beating each other, and blood, and bruises, and, and finally at the end, they declare one the winner. They lift his hands up and they said, "The conqueror, the winner, the champ." He's like, "I'm the conqueror." I'm the winner. You know, he's got a couple of teeth dangling there, and he's all bruised up and bloody. And, and, he, and, and he goes back and he runs into his wife. And he said, Honey, I'm the conqueror. I'm the champ. He has that million dollar check in his hand, and she reaches out and grabs and says, I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> you see, he went and took the beating. She received the bounty. Amen. Jesus went on the cross, endured the pain, the suffering. And He gave as a gift to us salvation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, again, we just thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for the promises in Your Word that they are yes and amen. And Lord, we're just careful this morning to give You praise and to give You glory for all that You have done. And most of all, Lord, we thank You for the salvation that You purchased for us, that you offer to us freely. And for that, Lord, we just can never thank you enough. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that even when life doesn't seem to be fair, Lord, we know that you're with us. We know that you're, uh, you're there ready to help and ready to lead and bring victory. We're just careful, Lord, to give you the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.